All right, welcome everyone to FCI Live. This is our last presentation of the February 22 series. We do this twice a year. We'll be back in September and the topics are very much picked based on what is going on with you all, what you say you would like to hear more about, what you're struggling with or what there aren't. There isn't enough information and materials out there about uh, for startup food co-ops. If you're not with a startup food co-op, if you're with an existing food co-op or a development center, welcome. Uh, you're really, we are glad to have you here. Just know that the content is very much usually aimed at startup level. A lot of it will still be super valuable for you. We are recording, so please go ahead and mute to make sure that we keep the sound, uh, the, the sound is not interrupted. We appreciate it. And of course, because we are recording, everyone always asks, yes, these videos will be available. Tonight's video with Nikki, as well as all the other ones in the series, I'll be sending out a link late Monday, probably, but you will get an email if you registered for any of these sessions, sending you to where you can find all the videos. All right, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And tonight's topic, is authentically inclusive with Nikki Jackson from Tenru Consulting. Uh, for those of you who, well, I'll let Nikki introduce herself. For those of you who don't know Nikki, Nikki has been a part of the startup food co-op community and the food co-op community for quite a while now, and has started doing work really sharing with us about disability inclusivity. And so we're really glad to have her back. This is not her first time with us, but you guys asked for more. So here's more. Uh, <laughs> Nikki, can you introduce yourself and talk just a little bit about yourself, give people some perspective? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, like JQ said, my name is Nikki Jackson. Um, I will identify myself and give a short um, image description of what I look like. I identify as a white cis short woman, um, and I am a blind slash disabled woman. Um, I, for the sake of this conversation, I will identify as capital B slash capital D blind disabled, which means that I am proud of my disability and I blind and disability and all of those sorts of terms are not considered bad words in my vocabulary. I don't try to distance myself from those identities. Um, so that is why I'm here today talking about ableism with you guys is because um, that's a really big part of my story. And like JQ said, I've been in the food co-op world um, for about four or five years now. And I love what the co-op world um, stands for and the movement and the progress that we're trying to make within society. And I just noticed that uh, the disability community is just lagging a little bit behind in terms of being included. Um, but FCI has done a great job in the last couple of years of giving me this platform. So I just really am grateful that you guys are asking me back and I appreciate that everyone is here to learn and that you know we'll paint with a broad brush and say that I feel like everyone has really good intentions of being inclusive. Um, I also want to start this session by saying that access is equality so if anyone in this session um, needs any accommodations. JQ I forgot to ask before we started recording but do we have closed captioning enabled? We we do have closed captioning enabled and we did send awesome. out with a registration right. to let us know if you had any needs. Exactly, so that that's a great practice to get in the habit of. I'm really proud of FCI for doing that. Um, I always forget <laughs> about the closed captioning until we've started. So that's still something I'm trying to get better with too. Um, but if anyone is having problems with their closed captioning working right now, you're invited to send a private message uh, to JQ specifically through the chat. Um, but when we post this on YouTube, we'll make sure that closed caption is turned on for that too. Um, but that's really important, an important practice to start um, with including accommodations at the top of a session uh, to make sure that everyone can participate fully. So that's, that's my intro introducing myself. So thank you, Nikki. Yep. And so um, I have, we're going to do this kind of interview style. So have, feel, please do feel free to throw your questions in the chat. It's going to be pretty interactive. I have a list of questions for Nikki that I'm going to ask about, uh, things I want to know, but also your questions are very welcome in the chat to enrich the conversation. I'm going to start, Nikki, with just, can you, you know, like you said, there's so much talking about all the different uh, ways that people are oppressed or left out, but we don't talk nearly as much lately about, or ever probably about ableism. 
for those of us who maybe, you know, we've heard the word, but can you talk about what ableism specifically is? Yes, I can. So ableism is, is newer. It's one of the newer isms, right? We're familiar with racism and sexism and classism and ageism. And there's even more than that, right? Um, but ableism is something, honestly, I'm going to be really vulnerable in this conversation with you guys today and say that up until very recently, I, as a, as a disabled person, didn't even think ableism was a thing. Um, I thought that the disabled community was being sensitive or um, anything like that. And so ableism is actually a really hard thing to define because it is newer and it's kind of different depending on who you ask. And so in trying to wrap around my head, my head around explaining ableism to able-bodied people, um, I went of course and searched the internet and, and I asked the disability community as well as the able-bodied community what they thought ableism was. And so you get kind of like a really short standard answer, like say Harvard's definition of ableism is a form of discrimination against somebody due to the fact that they're disabled. So I think we can all kind of agree like that makes sense, but in my disabled mind a few years ago, say, I thought like, well, what does it mean to be discriminated against? Like somebody just not including me, is that being discriminated against or at that point in my journey, I would think that discrimination would be what I experienced when I was trying to go to college and my teachers wouldn't give me my accommodations. That's what I felt was discrimination, was them not giving me access the same way all the other students got access to materials. Or um, one of my accommodations was getting books on tape or as an audio format. And a lot of my textbooks just didn't exist as an audio format back in the day. Um, so that is like a really broad and simple term of ableism, meaning discrimination against somebody who's able-bodied. And then you get a little deeper and another person would describe ableism as a system of oppression. And when you hear that, that kind of makes you go like, whoa, <laughs> yeah. like we don't want, like, again, we agree that that's a bad thing, but what does that really look like? To, to me, it's kind of just words. So I'm going to read to you, I'm going to try to read to you, um, a really good working definition of ableism. And by working definition, I mean, it is constantly getting added to, and it is um, organized by Talila T.L. TL Lewis, and they work throughout the disability community, specifically with um, a large portion of the deaf community. Um, but this is a comprehensive inclusion of a lot of people's opinions about, about what ableism is. And it's kind of long and it might be a little hard to digest. So we might pick it apart a little bit as we're going through it. So ableism according to disabled people is a system of assigning value to people's bodies and their minds based on societal constructed ideas of someone's productivity, desirability, normalcy, intelligence, and quote, fitness, I put fitness in quotes. <laughs> These constructed ideas are deeply rooted in eugenics, anti-blackness, misogyny, colonialism, imperialism, and of course, capitalism. The systematic oppression leads to people and society determining people's value based on their culture, age, language, appearance, religion, birth or living place, health and wellness, again in quotes, mm -hmm. and their ability to um, satisfactorily produce, reproduce, excel, and quote, behave. So meaning you behave the way society thinks you should behave. And this is important. You do not need to be disabled to experience ableism. 
I'm just going to sit with that for a second. Like, I really like that definition. And when I found it, this was just updated last month. They've been working on this definition for years and it gets updated every year. And so this was just updated um, to include that. So when you think about ableism, it's pretty much assigning value to someone based on how well their bodies work in our society. So that, that's the definition we're gonna work with today for the rest of our conversation. All right. And you know, like you said, you, you can sit and digest that and there are definitely some things in there. I was like, whoa, I'm gonna sit with that. And then there's some things where you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I get that, I agree, but I think, I think it becomes a little, when you don't live it, um, sometimes it's hard to understand without some examples. So I hope it's okay to ask, can you yeah. give us some examples of ableism in everyday situations? Yes. So personally, I like to break ableism up into different categories, right? So you can have the really like big scary ones, um, like habits and practices where you think like, well, that's systematic ableism or like we're being oppressed by, you know, culture. Um, but you can break it down more to that. And I like to break it down further into like interpersonal relationships, like the way we feel our attitudes and feelings towards people. And a lot of times they're unconscious. We don't realize it. We don't realize how we were raised to feel this way about disability. And also another big category is language. Like languages is what I'm really wrestling with right now. Um, just like you don't have to be disabled to experience ableism, disabled people can also be ableist and that's considered internalized ableism. And so that sort of thing would be if you're disabled, feeling like you're a burden or feeling like you're high maintenance or being sensitive, which is kind of alludes to what I meant uh, a few years ago where I didn't really think ableism was a thing. Um, within interpersonal relationships, my biggest thing is I noticed a lot of a lot of ableist language. And it's one of those things, um, a lot like the other isms, where once you see it, it's really hard to not see it. But you kind of, with ableism, you have to really train yourself and kind of always think about things that you're saying. So anytime that you're using words that would be like a real health issue or a real diagnosis or a real label or a, a physical condition, but you're using it as a descriptor for your day or how a situation is going, that's ableist. So my guilty, I'm totally guilty in doing this is like an example would be calling things lame. Lame is a condition. Lame means you can't walk or use your legs. And calling something that you don't think is going in an awesome way as lame means lame is bad, right? So lame is like a really big example right now that I, that's, I'm trying to get out of the habit of using, but other things that are really rampant in language in our society right now are calling things crazy or insane. Um, calling things OCD or bipolar, that's a really big one that kind of, that one really irks me too, is just because you like your um, pencils a certain way and you say about, oh, I'm, I'm being OCD right now. If you don't have a diagnosis of OCD, that's really offensive to say that. Um, so that's, those are some examples specifically with language. Um, another thing interpersonally is, um, oh, I have this written down. I should say this before I forget. There are a few big no-nos that are just terms that should not ever be used to describe disabled people. And this is collectively from the disability community is words that you shouldn't be using anymore to describe us is handicap, but also using euphemisms that again, kind of skirt around that. So handicapable or differently abled, that's just pretending like disability is a bad thing and you're trying to make it more rosier so it's more comfortable for you to deal with. Um, and another term that is really out of date that I'm continually still teaching people about is the term special needs. That is also a really big, um, the disabled world hates being labeled with special needs. Um, let's see, you had asked about. I asked about examples of everyday situations. I'm really glad yeah. you're getting into language though. I know that um, 
you know, full disclosure, that one gets to me a lot. I am mm-hmm. uh, ADHD and I hear people use that kind of as a joke for how their world goes all the time. Right. But then you start right. to notice when you're sensitive to that, how every, like so many other words you're using are exactly like that. Exactly. That are really talking about people's actual lived experience and you're using them as a descriptor or even a joke. Right, exactly. And they're usually, you know, in a very lighthearted way. And, but it's, it's just, a really bad habit <laughs> to be in. Um, so interpersonally, things that are said to me very often that again, people don't mean to be rude, but they are rude. Saying things like, I could never live like that. I could never live with your disability. Um, what's another thing? You You're don't so look- so brave. <laughs> yeah, that's too, yes, brave or inspiring. That is infant, like when you're calling, oh, you're so inspiring or you're so brave or those sorts of things. Um, that's infantilizing to us. It's kind of condescending. Uh, we don't want to be seen. So disabled people in society and in media, we're either seen as like, oh, those poor people or, oh, well, you're so inspirational. It's like one or the other. And it's never something in between. So that's something that we're trying to shy away from. And that's a topic for a whole nother talk. I could talk about that forever. Um, but saying to someone like, oh, you don't look sick, or I forgot you were disabled, like that, that happens to me a lot because I don't look blind unless I'm like using a device that is like a big show and tell that I am um, visually impaired. Um, so that happens a lot. I'm very independent and I do a lot of activities that a lot of able bodied people don't do. I'm a very adventurous person. And so That comes back to me a lot. Well, you don't look blind or I forgot you were blind or I forgot you were disabled. Um, And there's two points I wanna make on that statement. Um, One is that it doesn't make us, it doesn't erase the fact that we are disabled. So it's kind of like you're erasing our experience by saying like, oh, like I forgot, Uh, you're you're so capable that I forgot that you were disabled. And that's kind of like a double-edged, you know, backhanded compliment sort of thing. Um, the other thing is that this happens a lot. There is such a thing as people who identify as disabled, who um, have invisible disabilities or chronic illnesses and that sort of thing. And especially when you're young and or when you look, quote, normal, we're trying to get rid of the term normal. That's why I put it in quotes. The, the proper term is typical. So typical and atypical. So if someone doesn't look typical, um, it happens a lot where I will come out of a accessible bathroom stall or I need assistance with something and someone will say, well, you don't look sick or you don't look disabled. And I'm just here to say like, I really appreciate that there are people out there that care that people are using those resources even if they don't need it. But it's, I just don't want disability police out there. I don't, it really, I don't know anyone who's disabled who feels better knowing that there's people out there who are asking people like, oh, you shouldn't be using that stall. You shouldn't be using that parking space. If you witness someone using disability parking and you don't, and they don't have a placard or a license plate, tell the store, like tell the property owners or call the police, but it's not your job to like police that situation because you never know why those people are using that stall. And it's not like it can just make people really awkward and feel uncomfortable. And we're already in a, especially if we don't look sick, we're in a position where we're constantly trying to decide, oh, should I use that resource or should I mask? Should I, should I try to pass as able-bodied? We're always trying to push ourselves. And that's not always a healthy, that can be really toxic. And that can cause like internal, that's internalized ableism when, within itself. So um, saying to someone like, you don't look sick or I forgot you were sick can actually be really hurtful and harmful. So don't use the resources if you don't need it and tell your friends and your family and your children and the people that you have power over to not use those resources if they don't need it. But if you see someone and you don't know them from Adam, then don't say anything, please. Um, (laughs) So that's me getting off my soapbox for that one. Let's see if I had any other. Um, Oh, another one is, well, asking someone like, what's wrong with you? Like, I can't believe people still ask that, but it happens. 
I hear people, especially in wheelchairs, wheelchair users say that a lot where strangers will ask them, what's wrong with you? My answer to that, if someone asked me that, would to ask them that question back. I'm, I'm not polite. And I would say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> it's just a really weird thing to ask someone. Um, but that, that's a form. That is an example of um, ableism in everyday life. Yeah, and, and Brienne was bringing up the comments that, say, you know, having a friend with e who's young, who has EDS, who is constantly getting policed because some days she can walk, some days she can't, and she's constantly accosted, you know, by people yes. who think that they're being, able-bodied people who think they're being helpful in some way to right. try and police that. Right. So I personally also have EDS, and I will be, it, this was a really long time ago, I was with a friend and I had my placard to to have just to have disability parking and I said oh I have my placard like make sure make sure you park close and they're like oh we I don't need that we can park far away I need to get my steps in and I was just like hello <laughs> this <laughs> isn't for you it's my placard and you don't get to choose if I'm well enough today to walk that extra and everything so yes it's a very um it's a very common thing it's a very common occurrence so yeah, I think in listening to these examples, I think a lot of us can feel like, yeah, like that makes sense. Or yeah, I have people in my life who are affected by that. I know what you're talking about. Where I'd like to take this next is, how have you seen this? How do you see ableism manifest in the co-op world that you've interacted with? Okay. Um, so first and foremost, I'm going to put you on the spot, JQ, and I'm going to see do you know what like the little sentence slash paragraph is after the first cooperative principle? Do you know what the first cooperative principle is? Uh, no, the first one's not coming to me. Okay, that's fine. It's open, um, I think it's open and voluntary membership out that all are included. Yes. That is number so, one. So, yep, that's number one. So that's a really great example. It sounds awesome and I'm, it's really great that that is the number of, out of all the principles, it's the number one principle, right? Is that it's voluntary open membership. So I um, looked up the principles on four different cooperative websites and in the little blurb under it, what they say is that includes not excluding people because of their race, their politics, their gender, or their religion. So what's left out of that equation right off the bat? Mm -hmm. Your ability level. Right. Um, that's not specific. I don't want to pick on the co-op world. That is so not specific to the cooperative world at all. Right. That is the entire like diver DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion world. The ability is always left out. So that's just like, one really minute little example of like, we're just not being thought of, we're just not being included. So that's, that's one example, like as a whole cooperative world, but with my experience with co-ops, and I'll also preface this section by saying that I reached out to other people that I know who are disabled, who are co-op owners, and people who work with the disability community within the cooperative world. So these aren't all just my stories. Um, I tried to, like, I asked people, where, give me stories about ableism within your co-op or within the co-op world that you've noticed. And um, of course, like, COVID brought a lot of stuff to light, right? Like, when the pandemic hit, we all had to adjust. And um, so there were actually quite a few really sad stories that came from the adjustment that had to do with having to switch over to doing things virtually and doing like curbside pickup and all those sorts of things. Um, so I know that we, our audience, a lot of us aren't open yet. Uh, so I'll try to keep these examples to a minimum, but um, saying that like curbside pick for me personally, um, the website and the apps and the programs that were being used to organize curbside pickup and delivery and those sorts of things were not screen reader friendly. They weren't accessible. They also did not accept EBT or SNAP as a form of payment. So that's, that's if someone is disabled, they're a lot more likely to be on EBT. But that just goes to show that those services are more of a convenience they're not there for necessity or for people who need them. 
whether that be because they don't have transportation because they're blind or because they just can't drive for some other reason. They don't have a car or they're a single parent or they live in a city. There's like so many reasons why people don't drive and need food delivery. So the, the technology side of things I have found to be very inaccessible. I've been waiting for a particular company to have a accessible website for three years now. And that's just kind of boggles my mind because it doesn't take three years to build an accessible website. Um, but more specifically, like organizationally, um, if you have, say, a, a board meeting and you've done it virtually and um, owners are entitled to meeting minutes, correct? Mm -hmm. Like that's yeah. just standard within the co-op world. If you're an owner, you should get access to the meeting minutes. Right. There's been times where I've asked for meeting minutes and I've been told, well, we're not going to give those to you. You need to go to the store to read them. And so when they're not being provided in an electronic format, I just, that's ableist, but it's also just bad practice. Um, I think that like all of your resources should be available in multiple formats. It's not just about disabled people. It's, it's just better practice for everybody. So you're not just going to send an email. You, um, you might also like do a Facebook blast and um, maybe still do um, a phone tree or something like that. So having, ha this is one of those examples I, I talk about in other speeches a lot about where um, better practices kind of raise all the boats in the high tide. It's, mm -hmm. it's better for everybody. So if you have something as an electronic format, then people can accommodate themselves. Uh, so if I ask for the meeting minutes and it gets to me in an electronic format, then I can, I can do what I need to do with it. I can print it in larger print or I can have my screen reader read it to me. Or if someone needs it in Spanish, they can take that and they can translate it themselves in Spanish. Um, so not having access to things and then also gatekeeping information. Um, that was a story that someone else had told me within the co-op world that when the pandemic hit and they needed curbside pickup or delivery, and it wasn't being, it wasn't accessible to the disabled owners. The disabled owners had no way to like voice that. And that personally happened to me where I was told, oh yes, this issue has been fixed. And when owners went to the board, the board acted as if um, I was being sensitive or that I was trying to cause trouble. And it, other owners were told this has been addressed. And it really hadn't been addressed because no one followed up to make sure it actually had been addressed the way it needed to be. Um, so within the co-op world, I feel like we kind of have a much higher standard for um, serving our community and, and serving our owners because we're not shopping at like a big corporation. Like I would kind of expect that. It's one of the reasons why I like don't enjoy shopping at big corporations is that personal customer service experience, you know? Yeah. And so you expect that within a co-op, but it happens a lot where they just don't want to accommodate because they think you're making trouble. And that happened, uh, especially during the pandemic where I felt like I was being labeled as, uh, well, don't, don't bring this, don't keep complaining about it or don't keep talking about it because it's, it's gonna hurt the co-op. It's gonna make us look bad. And that is something that really needs to be um, avoided <laughs> at all costs, so. Right. Well, it's interesting to me too, because when you pointed out like, don't, and it seems like going back, but you know, don't be the ableism police for us, thank you. It, it goes back to this idea though, if it isn't visible, able people don't think it's, there's a disability, which leads mm -hmm. to us doing things like not turning on the closed captions, because we assume yes. everyone there can see. Not, right. you know, not, asking if anybody needs any accommodations because we look around the room and we don't see a wheelchair. Um, right. So I just want to point out that like this is there's some subtle ways I think for all of us that disability has manifested in our lives or people we're close to and we think ah oh, we've got it but what we don't mm -hmm. see doesn't exist and it leads to this same circular problem right of when we yeah. assume we know other people's ability levels we start really screwing up. Exactly. So I want to um, give one last example within this within the, the food world and the co-op world. And I love this example because it was 
it's another one of like my ableisms that I did not recognize. And when I did recognize it, I was like kind of horrified. I was like, oh my goodness, I never would have thought of that, which is funny because I'll tell you the story. But um, when we think of things, so I, I mentioned um, delivery and um, curbside pickup, how they're kind of being labeled as a convenience. They're not as convenient post-COVID, but pre-COVID, they were definitely a convenience thing, right? They were like a luxury. Um, and if you use them, people might judge you for being lazy, right? And so one of the things that I personally never would have considered this as a disability justice thing is whether or not your store decides to serve um, prepared foods or like not even like prepared foods like made foods but like pre-chopped vegetables and fruit yep. so that was something like for me I would just say like well you know you it's your choice whether you're going to chop your vegetables or not and if you have to pay more to have the store chop it for you then that's fair because the store had to pay that employee to chop those vegetables and you can just do it yourself and then I was listening at a food justice summit. They were talking about how there are certain communities that can't chop their vegetables. Say they have arthritis or they have EDS, which is what I have. Like I do have mobility issues with my hands sometimes. Um, or say they are living out of their car or they don't have a kitchen or for whatever. There's a lot of reasons why people might buy pre-chopped apples. And it's not us up to us to judge them for that. So I really um, would like to encourage like co-ops co that aren't open yet. Like when you're coming up with your food and your pricing of things, um, really think about whether things are being priced fairly for the people who need them. If they are considered a, a convenience thing for one group of people, it might not be a convenience item for another group of people. And the disabled community specifically were already underemployed and, you know, don't have the best health insurance. And there's all these other things stacked against us. So to have to pay more for food. Um, another thing that comes to mind with that is I am very uh, environmental. I pride myself in being um, an environmentalist and trying to do things sustainably. And I don't know if you guys heard, uh, there was a big thing a few years ago with the straw band. With the straws. People, no more plastic straws, no more single use plastic. And I was totally gung ho for that. Yes, I agree. We all need to stop using straws. And then I learned from the disability community that that added when the law actually passed in certain states, I think it was New York City, I'm guessing. I'm, I think I'm remembering that New York City uh, banned single use straws. That was another barrier for disabled people who needed a straw to drink that they then had to jump through. And when I, when I thought of it in that perspective, like what barriers are we putting up for disabled people? Then I kind of changed my thoughts on that and thought, okay, we still need to be telling able-bodied people and people who can drink without a straw to avoid the single use straw, right? But it's not up to someone else to put that on a disabled person like oh sorry we're not allowed to carry plastic straws anymore mm -hmm. um so trying to be careful of not shaming people for what they need um mm -hmm. in like the environmental world and the co-op world i think that's like a big thing to be aware of moving forward too I think absolutely. This comes up a lot in food co-op world. You know, we're talking about don't be the disability police. We like to be the police, the food police, the plastic police, mm -hmm. the everything police in the co-op world. We really do. And I'm going to admit to one here because, you know, and while you're sharing, Nikki, she's the only one. <laughs> we had a local farmer who's a lovely human being, but they were so frustrated. This big poster, I'm so frustrated because I went to the grocery store and there's all this, I think it was sweet potatoes, pre-diced sweet potato wrapped in plastic and styrofoam. And I'm like, you know, you could just buy my freaking sweet potatoes and just chop them up. And then someone went and she's, this person is a lovely human being. <laughs> but yeah. I was like, um, that pre-chopped vegetable is the difference between me being able to make dinner or not because of my physical disability and more and more and more stories came forward. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, but this is a favorite one amongst cooperators. We're going to police plastic, <laughs> right? Yeah. But we're it not doesn't have to be in styrofoam though. Like, this please don't do styrofoam. 
This is true. You could, you but, could do plastic, but really disabled people. I mean, I, I sit as a disabled person, I don't need styrofoam. I would prefer it. <laughs> But I think that it yeah. was to what that came down to is, you know, this is an argument that can be had at a higher level with like an organization about using styrofoam. But yeah. when we start, but what we like to do is judge people for what we see, as you say, is convenience, yeah. you know, and we do it with other types of food too. There are people with, uh, in our community with severe IBS, uh, they can't eat anything that's whole grain. And we had a customer at our co-op who was pushing and pushing and pushing for an item we made in the deli to be made with white rice. And people were, and finally our cook was like, you know, we focus on healthy food here. And I was like, oh. But what's healthy for you isn't healthy for me. Right. Yeah. So I think the policing yeah. game gets real dangerous in general, no matter which way it goes. And we have to watch it in the food co-op world. Did you have other examples you wanted to share with us? No, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I want to get into a whole different area a little bit. Yes. When people are like, okay, we're going to do something about this. We're going to, and, and one of the ways we want to do something about this is we want representation. Yes. So we're going to do something about representation. And this leads, I don't even think I have to direct connect the dots for you, but this leads sometimes to this uh, little issue called tokenism. Yeah. And can you talk about tokenism and what it is and maybe even some ways it plays out in the co-op world? Yes, for sure. So I looked up the definition of tokenism and according to the Webster dictionary, tokenism is the practice of doing something um, specifically to give the appearance that everyone is being treated fairly. I thought that was a pretty spot on um, definition considering that it came from uh, a dictionary. Um, what the example that they gave is hiring a person um, from a minority in order to make it look like they're being treated fairly. Um, I wanted to say that part because in my learning about all the isms in over the last couple of years, I actually was uh, told that the term minority is actually offensive and we need to be replacing it with marginalized groups. So I try to make that a point. I try to continue to pass that information on and, and uh, teach people that little tidbit because I did not know any better. <clears throat> but I, I saw a really great short YouTube video by a woman named Nikki Lemmer and she gave a great example of tokenism. And so she gave this example of you're sitting around your boardroom and you're thinking, we need more insert group of people here on our board. Like we're looking very like monochromatic right now and we need more people who look different than us. Um, so we need to go and, and grab them and bring them into our organization. Um, that would be, a really good sign that what you're doing is tokenism because you want them there to like so that it looks like and we I don't think people do this on purpose like I think they're like okay great we want to represent we want people to feel welcome so we're going to put all different sorts of people in our ads like on our billboards or in our flyers or something like that or on our Facebook pages we're going to emphasize these people on our Facebook posts but it's totally transactional all it is, is they've come, they, you've taken their picture and that's it. Those people aren't a part of the discussion. They're not asked like, how would you like this photo to, to look? Or is this authentic to who you are as a person? Or are we putting you in a situation that isn't you know, real? Like, would you do this in real life? Um, so you can avoid tokenism by being sure from the very beginning to include disabled people and people of all marginalized groups in the discussion from the get-go. They need to be on your board of directors. They need to be a part of your ownership and membership, uh, which means you need to be reaching out to groups where these people are present, which honestly is not that hard to do. Disabled people make up 24% of the population. So that means one in four adults in America has a disability, whether you realize it or not. Like that's a really huge group. <laughs> it's like the largest, marginalized group and it's the only group that anyone can join at any point. Um, so bringing them in so that they're part of the process and listening to what they say. Um, so 
I'm going to give a plug for the up and coming conference right now, shameless plug. Um, I spoke for up and coming last year and they asked me to come back this year. And part of uh, that process was that I kind of gave the organizers some ideas like this is where you could be doing better to include disabled people. Um, and it starts from the planning, right? <laughs> it starts from making sure the event is uh, accessible, but also the registration and the website and everything from start to finish needs, you need to be asking, um, how do we make this accessible? So I can say that up and coming is not using me as a token and saying, hey, we have a disabled speaker who's speaking on ableism because their web page this year, I don't, uh, their webpage this year specifically has a paragraph that says, we want to be welcoming to disabled people. This is how you contact us if you need accommodations. And we're asking all of our attendees to please um, refrain from wearing strongly fragranced things to um, make sure that people with chemical sensitivities are safe at our conference. And that was something that was in the material that I had given to Up and Coming prior to you know, agreeing to, uh, well, prior to like, before we even started organizing for the year is what I'm trying to say. Like I gave this to them months ago and now I know like they're listening. They're not just using me as a token. I'm not just there to make them look good that they're including me, but they're listening to what I have to say and they're learning and they're moving forward with that information. That's the difference. It's relational. It's not inter interactional, uh, transactional. So that would be my difference. We like for tokenism. Um, and Nikki Lemmer, the video that I watched, she had a really great way of putting it. She said, instead of asking yourselves, we need more of X, Y, Z in this room, how do we go and get them and, and bring them into this picture? If you're asking yourself the question, who are we missing? Who are we missing right now? Like, I can almost guarantee you that most of the time you'll be missing the disability community. You might also be missing another community, another marginalized group um, that might be specific to like your geography or your location or what your community is made up of. But I can guarantee you, you have disabled people there because we're a very large group. So and we're all very, very different and it's not one size fits all. So that's why you need those people at the table to speak on these things, um, because we're all very, very different and have different um, needs. So I'm going to put you a little on the spot. We didn't talk about this in advance, but I know one of the concerns I hear with tokenism when we do bring people in, though, like, let's get someone on the board, you know, let's make sure we have representation, is that we then turn to that person and say, okay, you represent the disability community. Are we doing right. this right? So, yeah. so what do you say to that piece? Like, yes, we get someone at the table, but even, you know, it's in, like, you know, as a queer person, like, oh, you're the queer person in the room. How do you right. feel about this? Oh my God, <laughs> I'm not speaking for the entire queer community. <laughs> so how how can board you know boards can include can include but and make sure it's a conversation? But how do we avoid that? Like putting someone on the spot to speak for their entire community? Um, I would say that it's kind of like um the same mentality and sentiment be behind like, oh, I'm not racist. I have a black friend. Um. I kind of, I'm not ableist, I have a disabled friend. Um, so like, you shouldn't just have a black friend. Um, you don't just stop there. And so I would say, don't just you know come to me and get my opinion or my input. I'd love to work with you and I would love to do that with you. But when I give people feedback, I always give them a resource list of like, all the other disabled people that I can, that I learn from, because we're all learning from each other. We all have different disabilities and we all kind of come at our activism in different ways. And so just don't, don't stop with one person, I guess would be my answer to that is to continue to reach out. And the, my biggest rule of thumb in that is that if you're doing something for a disabled community or a, like a, a kind of disability, so like blindness or deafness or wheelchair users, um, make sure you're finding resources and listening to people who live those experiences, not like 
I read the most ableistic website once and it was like a federation for blindness, but it was a federation by doctors. And so they were calling blind people burdens on the society. Like it said that on the website that I was a burden to society and it had like a dollar sign of how much money I cost society for being blind. And like, so my point in telling you that is to say, make sure you're listening to people who are, have those lived experiences and don't just stop at one. Find out a lot of different uh, disability community, like different communities within your, um, disabilities within your community. Mm -hmm. I know we, I want to get a little time for Q&A at the end and we're kind of pushing it. So before we do that though, any quick like tips you really want, I know that, you know, I asked you to think like about the startup community, any yeah. quick tips you wanted to share with folks? Yeah. If you're still starting up and you're organizing, I'd say your number one job, like your number one focus thing that you could focus on being really inclusive in is like your owner recruitment. And if you're trying, if you actively want to try to find and welcome disabled people of all disabilities, look up and see if your community has a center for independent living. They serve disabled communities, whether they're temporarily disabled or if they become disabled later, later in life. And they're a great place, I think, to connect with. So if you want to have an event there or put your flyers there or connect with their outreach person in some way, that kind of is a really good first step because it's kind of all encompassing You'll get your toe in the water and uh, get connected specifically with the disability uh, organizations that are in your town. And a lot of towns have centers for independent living. So I would just Google that center for independent living in your town and see uh, what resources you have there. Okay. Anything else you wanna share before we go to our questions? No, I'm ready for questions. All right. Um, we're gonna jump back to one. I promised Brandon we'd get back to this, and I don't know if you can answer this one if you feel comfortable. But um, Brandon asked, could you provide with a, a term that should be used instead of special needs? I work in special education, and I'm surprised to hear this because it's a term I that I feel like everyone uses, and I'd love to do better and know better. Yes, special education, and especially in the education world, special needs is the term that's been used forever. I was considered special needs. Mm -hmm. um, Instead, honestly, a lot of us would just prefer to be called disabled. Um, but I realized that when you're working with kids, uh, you, they might not be, as, as I describe myself as my pride, my proud disabled identity. Mm -hmm. So it's not a one size fits all. Honestly, when it comes to everybody, especially kids, just do your best to call them what they identify themselves as, like what they want to be called. So if I, I say I'm blind, I am a blind woman, I introduce myself as blind. If someone were to say like, this is my friend Nikki, she's visually impaired. That drives me, I was going to say crazy, but that would be ableist. <laughs> that, that bothers me when someone calls me visually impaired because I called myself blind. So in term, instead of special needs, I would say disabled. I've also heard uh, within the school systems and they've switched away from the word special needs and they've changed it to exceptional, which just makes me laugh because <laughs> I feel bad for the kids that aren't exceptional like I am. <laughs> like, I just think that's really funny, um, but. I'm gonna behave myself and not express a lot of opinions as a person who was in that category and also parenting someone who's in, who's in that category. Um, I know how the special needs teaching community feels about it, but the term is, yeah, you guys are kind Except of stuck. Exceptional or special needs. Except, uh, we had, uh, I can't stand either. And the reason yeah. is in my case is that the system of schooling needs to change to stop labeling people like that. And because when we label people, then no matter what the label is, it's going to turn right. into a negative one. Um, right. But in our school, they actually for a long time called it, uh, they didn't have a term for it, they had accommodation specialist. And I loved okay. that. We had, a, we had accommodation yes. programming, we had accommodation <clears throat> whatever, but that meant that at least uh, the job is on the school. It isn't yeah. that the kid's a burden. So yes. I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> no, that's great. Oh, and, sure. and we are trying to, to shift to a world of universal design so that accommodations aren't needed. That's like the whole goal of the accessibility advocacy group is to switch from accommodations just to everything working properly <laughs> for everybody. 
Um, exactly. We got a good one here from Free Range. I want to make sure we have time for this one for you. Yeah. Um, they said, you know, we're, if you're working with architects to design your store and you're allowing them to decide the accommodations for people with mobility issues, any hints, that, you know, concerns about that? I don't claim to be uh, an expert on that. I am very rarely a wheelchair user, um, but I would say making sure that your architect, for every step of the way, making sure that when you're interviewing your architect or like when you're trying to find, you know, a web designer or whatever, just let them know that accommodations and accessibility beyond what is ADA required. Like this isn't just like, we're gonna follow the law, but we actually like wanna be great at this. If you let them know that that's your priority and you use that as a one of your bullet, it doesn't have to be the top bullet point, but one of the bullet points of why you hire someone for those jobs, mm -hmm. um, that would be my, my suggestion for that. And also if you wanna go above and beyond, I would say to, make sure you're paying people for their time to do this. Don't expect disabled people to give you these services for free, but I've done things like done walkthroughs for buildings and said like, yeah, that, this won't work for me or that sort of thing. Um, I've been on quite a few like advisory committees for that sense. And so that would be another great um, suggestion to connect with your Center for Independent Living if you have one they might know like local architects or web designers or whatever that know those sorts of things. Um, but beyond just like what's legally required is what I would say for that. I love that idea of asking to be saying like, we're, we want to be great at this. I love the other mm -hmm. stuff. I'm like, but that one never occurred to me because- Or like take you know, one of those like motor carts and drive it around your store and see how, like if you're setting up your displays, have an employee drive that around the store and see what it's like, see what they can reach, see what's in their way, see if they can get the doors open, like do a run through and do it. And, and you will find services. What we did at our co-op is we did actually pay a disability group that came through annually and go. reviewed our store. Yeah, um, do, so that. You, do that. <laughs> you can find people, find disabled, and it was a, it was a student group. Uh, they were grad students working on disability issues who were disabled people themselves, and they wanted to do it for free. By the way, hint, I'm going to say it, don't let them do it for free. If yeah. you really respect disabled people's time, pay disabled people to get the work done. They're going to maybe right. offer to do it for free because they're just so glad somebody is going to make get, do something. But right. let's uh, let's compensate people. Um, Catherine has asked if she can uh, unmute and make a comment. Yes. Uh, let's, let's go ahead. So I don't use a wheelchair, but I find that um, the ramp is essential for me to get into a building. There is a building, in, there are two buildings in my community that are not accessible, that the only way you can get from one level to the next level is with stairs. And I'm finding that I am needing assistance to get up those stairs. Mm -hmm. And um, so I have to ask because just looking at me, they assume that I can climb those stairs. And um, so just remember that um, um, you can't always see a disability and mm -hmm. you need to be cognizantly aware that disabled people come in all shapes, sizes and mm -hmm. whatever. And yep. They look abled, but they're not always abled. And put those ramps where they're going to be the most effective because you're going to find people walking up them as well as wheelchairing up them. And I do have ADHD too, Jacqueline. I'm done. Welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> there's quite a club. I bet there's someone else on the call too. I'm just betting. Um, any other last questions, comments? One thing I love that Nikki is modeling that I want to share to all of us is I think, you know, co op people always want to, we're all doing the work we're doing because we want the world to be a better place. We're all trying very hard to support justice. And so we see first where we're getting it right and we get real scared of getting it wrong. And I love how Nikki's been modeling getting it wrong. And you know what? When you get it wrong, you learn, you apologize, and you do better. We move on. Yeah. So, you know, I, was, I love that because actually I'm going to admit too, Nikki's like, before we start, said, oh, do you have closed captioning on? I'm like, oh yeah, of course I do. This is only the second session I've had closed captioning on. I have forgotten through the entire series until today. Why did I remember? Nikki. So <laughs> I just- But we'll have closed captioning on all the YouTube videos, right? 
I will so it doesn't it just end yeah. there. When you post them, then they will be accessible, which is better than them never being accessible, right? Yes. So yes. that's going to happen on Monday. And then if it doesn't, one of you are going to come and remind me that you just saw a video with no closed captioning because we can hold each other accountable and help each other out. But I just let's work on not being ashamed of making the mistakes and just fix them and ask for help fixing them if we need it. So mm -hmm. we do have one last question here. Okay. Uh, have you noticed greater push or need for different strategies to talk about disability and accessibility for communities that are not English speaking or of other cultures? Um, I will admit that the language is always the last thing I think of personally, because I'm privileged and I live in a place where my first language is the language that is spoken. Um, but I have noticed uh, one of the organizations that I really promote is called Disability Lead. They're based out of Chicago and they have like a leadership institute for disabled people. And they do a great example because they're in Chicago, they're a really big city um, that their materials are all available in multiple different languages. Um, so that's really the thing that makes me cognizant of the language um, barrier that can happen sometimes. But other than that, I, I can't really speak to it beyond that. I don't have much experience um, with that. Uh, yeah, I don't really think that answered your question, <laughs> but no, it, it is, a, it is an issue for sure. Um, but that's also going to be an issue specific, I think, to like your region where you are. So one region might have more Spanish speakers versus another region that might need, you know, um, Mandarin or something else. So, um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Any other last questions before we wrap up? It's not, the, the work's never done, but we take first steps and we get moving. And he gave us some great guidance on yeah. how to get started here tonight. And I think all of us can hear that a lot of this also in the tokenism, especially piece that this applies to more isms than just ableism. So I know yes. I got a lot to take home from here. Thank you so much to Nikki for coming out and joining us tonight and helping us with this session. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm going to send JQ a resource list that has like an a plethora of places you can go if you're still interested in learning more on any of these things. And I made sure to include all different platforms. So if you like podcasts, I list podcasts. If you like YouTube, I list YouTube's books, if you like books. Um, and I'm actually hosting a, a book club. We read a different disabled author every month. And that's been a lot of fun because I am always wanting to learn from other disabled people. So there's a and lot of resources. If you're wanting on to find out any more about you and what you do, is LinkedIn the place, your company? Yes, yes. Um, I am on LinkedIn. My It's Nikki Jackson on LinkedIn, but my company name is Tenru, T-E-N-R-H-U. You can find me at tenru.com or you can email me at nikki at tenru.com. And if you have a hard time remembering that, it's short for Tenacious Rhubarb, Tenru. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Nikki. Everyone have a great night. Thank you.